want to welcome you this morning to Small Point Baptist Church. Glad you are all here. I hope you're all uh, preparing for a great celebration of your mothers today. And if you're a mother, we want to say Happy Mother's Day to you. So we do have a gift for you at the end, ladies. Uh, I'm going to ask the teenagers uh, at the end of service. They will gather in the, they're in the kitchen. All right. Okay. If you guys can grab the vase and head out to the carnation. So do not leave without receiving your Mother's Day gift from us. Okay, ladies? Every lady gets one, including the girls. I guess all the girls get one. All right? Like lovely flowers. We just want to just celebrate you today. Um, welcome you here. We do have uh, a couple of announcements, but first of all, we have to get to something very important. I uh, think I'd be killed if I don't recognize this. But next Saturday, we have a very special birthday in our household. Our youngest is going to be 13. Oh, oh I'm going to die. I've got four teenagers in my household after next week. But very exciting. She's she is such a lovely young lady. I get to brag on her. But um, so we're gonna see how to work it. So it's right, it was, it's right here in front of me. So if you would like to give something towards that, please, today's the last day we're going to collect for that. Uh, next Sunday, don't forget, we will cel be celebrating our seniors, uh, not our older seniors, but our graduating seniors. Uh, someone made a comment when, I'm trying to remember where I was at, but we made the, this discovery that um, we shouldn't have funerals anymore for when someone dies who, you know, who's lived a long life. We should have graduations. Because you graduated to eternal life. Amen. All right? It's not just a solemn time. It's a, you're graduating to be with Jesus forever. So, all right? So that was just kind of a cool discussion that we had. But next Sunday, we'll have our senior celebration. Uh, we will have uh, food afterwards. So remember, everyone, bring something to share. Uh, we'll have hamburgers, hot dogs. We will uh, celebrate our two graduating seniors, Kate Campbell and Liberty Wyman. All right, very excited about that and very sad at the same time. Miss those two in our youth, youth ministry, but they'll come back and visit us, right, everybody? Okay, good. As, as long as you come back and visit us, we're, we're good. I know your mom, you miss your mom, she needs to come visit us, okay? All right, um, and uh, you two need to see me after service. I have some, some stuff I need to set, give you, okay? All right, anyway. Um, uh, don't for, uh, also, don't forget, uh, we have the mission team coming in June. Um, next week, I'm hoping to have an actual schedule for everybody. Marvin has been meticulously working hard and getting everything together, so hopefully to have that out for you. But just continue to pray for what's going to happen while they are here. Um, and it's been asked this morning, Gene has asked me, if anyone would like to make something for Geneva's funeral, uh, they are looking for help with the food for her service on May 21st. Uh, don't forget, Geneva's service will be at the fire station at 1 o'clock. Um, uh, so th they're asking us to help provide food for, for that. So if you are interested, please see Jean Scott, and she will write it down and tell you what needs to be done. Um, I think that's all the uh, announcements that I have for today, other than tonight there are no Olympians because it's Mother's Day. We want all our kids to celebrate and be with their moms. And Tuesday night, there's no youth group. Remember, kids, there's no youth group because it is the VMS concert, spring concert. So there, there won't be any youth group on Tuesday night. I don't think I have any more announcements. Rachel, have I got everything? Okay. All right. Well, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 55 and verse number 22. And it says, Cast the cares of the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. And that's, you know, every Sunday, that's what we're supposed to do. Come and cast our cares at him, knowing he will firmly plant us, and he will help us, and he will guide us. So let us stand this morning and begin by singing our, our cast, our cares chorus, and cast our cares on our Lord's feet.
our scriptures to Titus chapter 2. We're going to read verses 3 to 5 this, this morning, if I can actually get there. Paul writes these instructions to the church and to young Titus as he leads the church. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. May God add the blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. All right, kids. Time for our kids' corner. If you are visiting with us, if you'd like to come down and join us, you can come right up here in the front and sit right up here. Y'all, get up here. Honey. All right. Turn our attention to 
our prayer time this morning. Um, I do want to say we need to be in prayer for Frida. Um, she has been in and out of the hospital twice this week. Um, and I don't know the latest of where she's at, but um, we need to be praying for her vertigo. And it's just getting worse for her. So I just ask everyone to, to lift her up in prayer. Um, are there any other prayer requests this morning? Oh, look at that beautiful little girl. Oh, look at that. Liberty's got a, got a best friend now. Woo! How exciting. Are there any other prayer requests that we can have? Uh, Mary. Join our hearts together and let's pray for these. Seek the Lord. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity, this privilege we have to gather in this place to praise you, to hear from you, but Lord also to pray. And as we learned last uh, last week or the last few weeks, how prayer is such a pinnacle part of our life. And Lord, how we are to pray and why we are to pray. And, and Lord, we come with a sincere heart and desire, Lord, to see you magnified and glorified, to see you reveal yourself to so many through healing, through comfort, through peace, through strength, through the help that uh, we all desperately need. And for those, Lord, that are without hope, that they find hope in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, this morning as we gather here, we want to honor you, we want to glorify, we want to pray, Lord, that your will be done, Lord, that your kingdom would come in our lives, Lord, we would be about what you called us to be. We would be faithful in obedience to follow you. You'd help us to see the need around us, and Lord, to ask for how we can help or how others can help and be your hands and feet in this community. We thank you for uh, those in the mission team in Georgia, for our sister churches, Lord, that are uh, willing to sacrifice and to come up here to be with us and help us to be on mission, to help us to revive and restore the work that you are doing here. Or that the people of this community would see that love and they would be drawn, you know, Lord, by your love and your, your good works. 
And so, Lord, we pray for that. We pray, Lord, for one another. We pray for our, our homes. We pray for just the, the ability to teach uh, the truths of your word, to live them out as examples. We pray that you would help us to be in, investing in our neighbors and those around us. We pray particularly this morning as we have said, Lord, to come and cast our cares at your feet, knowing that you care for us, Lord, and, and to know, Lord, that everything is in your hands. And so we lay the lives of these that are dear and near to us, Lord, that our family, that our friends, that are, that are part of our body. And we ask that you would work in a way that would bring healing and strength, encouragement, but also that you would be glorified in. We think of Frida this morning, and she struggled so much with her vertigo this week. And Lord, had been in and out of the hospital. And right now, Lord, I, I know that she, got, she was taken the other day, and I don't know if she's come home, but we pray for her. We pray for her spirit because she's, I know that she is discouraged because of this vertigo. And we pray that you would be her strength and be her, um, just her, her firm foundation in this time of, uh, of unknowing of what's taking place. That she could be a witness, a instrument for your glory or for others to see that through this circumstance, through this trial, through this physical ailment that she's facing, that others would see your love shine forth from her. We pray for, for um, Mary's daughter-in-law, Angie, Lord, if she's had a revert, uh, an adverse reaction to this medication. We pray for her in the hospital that you would just help her to overcome this. And, Lord, help her to overcome this broken rib and to find healing. And, Lord, to be strengthened. We pray for Rob and Colleen and thank for the good report that Colleen is doing better. But, Lord, I know she misses being here. We pray that you would bring healing as she uh, is just... Uh, uh, contact contracted COVID and for Rob to keep him safe from it for Fred and Deb as they go through their physical uh, ailments each week Lord uh, for Deb's um, migraine headaches and back pain and for Fred as he goes through chemo and Lord has this just been so weakened by it we pray that you would just help him and be strengthened by your spirit Lord in, in what's going on and the healing that's going to come we praise you for the report of Doug Alexander and for the healing that's taking place. We pray for his continued recovery. We pray for the mission team as they prepare to come for this fundraiser, Lord. And Lord, it's just extra expense this year because of the cost of things, but they want to come and serve and follow you. And we pray that you would just provide the funds necessary, Lord, for them to come and, and to, to do what you planned and purposed. We pray for Steve and, and Linda Thayer as Steve has contracted COVID. And we pray for his healing and strengthening. We pray for Andrew and this issue with his growth plate and the pain that it's causing. We pray that you would resolve that and the doctors would be able to, to figure out how to um, help him through that. We pray for the for Aunt Laura and others, Lord, that are, are homebound. And Lord, we pray right now for our world, for the world in which we live in. And day to day, Lord, as we watch, we hear of things that uh, are going on around the world that uh, are wicked and evil. And we think especially of the things that are going on in Ukraine. And we pray for the people. We pray for their protection and Lord for their just being rescued from this onslaught Lord, from this um, imposed war upon them. We pray Lord that you would resolve this and bring peace and recovery Lord to the many lives that have been displaced and, and taken Lord. We pray for healing, we pray for peace and comfort. We pray Lord that you would just bring about a swift end to this conflict this war that's taking place over there. And Lord, the impact that it's having on all of us in the whole world. We pray, Lord, that as we look forward, we look forward to uh, the return of our Savior, and we ask that you would just help us, Lord, to be patient and endure and be faithful, Lord, in obeying, obeying and following that you've committed us to. So, Lord, we ask that as we prepare for your word, that you'd help us to to receive the instruction that your, your spirit would fill us and lead us and guide us, Lord, and to apply it. For today we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning you have a special treat before I come and preach. Probably a shortened message because I do want the mothers to get home and enjoy their Mother's Day. So I will not wax eloquence today. Or so I hope. All right. Um, but uh, Austin Lewis is with us, and it has been asked of him to come and play and sing and so, Austin, if you wouldn't mind, and come, and uh, you know, we, should, we should all congratulate because he is now Reverend Austin Lewis. All right. Thank you for having me. Please come and share with us the gift that God has given you. Well, 
praise the Lord, everybody. It's so good to be in this house. I don't really know where I'd rather be but in the presence of God, because in His presence there's fullness of joy. And it's just good to be back at Small Point Baptist Church again. I haven't been here for a while. It's just so good to see all of your faces. And happy Mother's Day to all you moms. I'm going to play a Jesus melody that's dear to my heart. And I just pray for your church to you.
so much, Austin. I think that piano has missed you playing it. <laughs> I know I've missed you playing it. <laughs> Nothing against you, Gina. I love you playing it, okay? <laughs> Nothing there, Gina. I'm not saying anything, okay, Gina? I, I, I'm on I, vacation again. All right. <laughs> But when you do retire and you go on vacation for three months, you know, it's nice to have someone who can play, okay? Boy, I better stop before I get myself in trouble. <laughs> Woo, boy, that's one thing I know I'm really good at, to get myself in trouble. Just ask my kids. But anyway, so today we, we, we set aside this day as a special day to honor mothers. And I wrestled this week about continuing it in, in Matthew, uh, preaching uh, as we continue the Sermon on the Mount, or focusing on mothers. And as the Spirit would lead me this week, and through the voice of my lovely wife, um, and encouragement that she gave me, I felt that, you know, it's been a while since I've actually preached a Mother's Day message, that I'm going to preach this morning from Titus chapter 2, something that I think is important in the church if we're to be healthy. Um, it's an important thing that is missing from the church. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a connection that we need to strive for. If we are going to be what God wants us to be. And so mothers, I want to preach not just, just about being a mother. I want to talk about the responsibility of a spiritual mother. And, and really, you know, God's instruction to mother relationships in the church. Because as a follower of Christ, God calls us to love one another, to teach one another. And he gives specific instructions on how the ladies of the church are to disciple the ladies of the church. And the men of the church, which, by the way, you're not going to get off the hook, guys, because next month is Father's Day, and you're going to get you're going to get it lovingly too. <laughs> but I think that in honoring our mothers, we need to honor one another and, and, and think about the spiritual state in which we honor the ladies of our church, and for those that the spiritually mature and the responsibility that God gives us, the biblical mandate. Because when God writes in his word, it's not just about, you know, here, here's a nice thing you might want to consider. All right? You might want to do this. No, no, this is a God gives specific instruction and, and he says for us to, to have a mindset of thinking of investing in one another in every generation. And I, want, and, and, and I think because of that disconnect, there's a huge loss in why younger people leave the church. Whether it's male, the, the boys, or the ladies. There's a loss of connection, a loss of family. We need to restore that. And so today I just want to talk about God's instruction for spiritual motherhood. And, and right here, in Titus, and Paul's writing to Titus about how to have a healthy church. And isn't that what we want? Don't, don't we want to be healthy? Doesn't everyone like being healthy? I mean, this past week I've struggled physically with my health to the point to where my, my wife is like, I jump around in the skin when I cough. All right, it's, it's been one of those weeks where I've struggled with breathing one day. I felt like I was like, I had the difficulty breathing, but it, it started to go away as I moved around. And, and, and it, of course, with springtime, I mean, you got all those lovely allergens out there and, and everything else. And we won't mention COVID on top of that, but don't, don't worry, I don't have COVID, okay? All right, that I'm aware of. <laughs> But anyway, but as I unpack this great responsibility, I want us to talk about how the, the health of our church is built upon the relationships we have. Because the greatest commandment is what? To love God with all that we have, and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're to love each other. I mean, the, Jesus even instructed the disciples, by your love for one another will they know you are my disciples. We're supposed to be involved with one another. We're supposed to love each other. We're supposed to... Okay, hug each other maybe once in a while. Okay, I'll just, just do there. Now, I don't know if you've never been hugged by Miss, by Miss Dot, you're missing out. Because they're some of the greatest hugs. I almost feel like getting decapitated every time. But it's like, great. All right? I love it. All right? And it makes me feel so much better when I get up here and preach. To, you know, that there's something about it. But when we think about what Paul instructs the church, there's something that I want to just it, to tell you ladies this morning. Lovingly and kindly as your pastor, that God has a responsibility for you in the church. Not just to come and, and to make good food, because you're really good at that. All right? Not to come and, and take care of the little kids, but there's a responsibility to, to help each other to grow in your relationship with Christ. And if you're not fulfilling that, if you're not urging and pushing each lady along, then you're missing the mark of what God has called you to do in the church. 
That's what he says here. Likewise, teach the older women. All right. So first of all, I'm going to start with the older saints in our church. You, you ladies that have lived a good life, and you, you've had families, you've got grandbabies, you may have great-grandbabies, you, you're responsible. You're supposed to be the mature ones, the ones with all the wisdom. That's what all the white hair is for, right? Or is that just stress from your husbands? <laughs> all right. I know where that comes from. Come on now. So my wife has more gray hairs than me, okay? Oh boy, I better, I better watch myself I'm really gonna be in the doghouse today. So, first of all, spiritual mothers instruct by example. Because really, he says here, you're to teach what is good. Your, your job is to be an instruction manual for the next generation. But that doesn't mean you stand back and say, watch me and do as I do. It's a, hey, let me come alongside you. Let me lovingly help you. And that's what Paul's going to instruct them to do. But it starts with where you're at, what you've gone through. And he says, you're, you're to instruct by example, by first of all, being reverent in the way you live. That word reverent, what does that, what does that mean? The word reverent typically means to honor God. And the Greek society would have understood this to mean that a mature Christian woman should demonstrate the holiness of heart that is near to God. So Paul says, you older ladies, you're supposed to be so near to God that people see God in you. They see him just flowing forth from you with a, with a growth from his word. With, it, with the idea of his, his, his holiness, his presence being felt as you, as, you, as you come and you live. John Stott, uh, Pastor John Stott states that they are to practice the presence of God and to allow their sense of his presence to permeate their whole life. So to live in a, in a reverent way means that no, whatever you do, you're doing to the glory of God. You're living out the practical practices of being obedient followers of Christ. And so he says, older women, be reverent in the way they live. And how, what does that mean? How do you be reverent? Well, the first thing he says about women is to not be slanderous. I'm just going to stop and, you know, because I'm going to say I'm just as bad as a woman at this. All of us are. Our tongues get really loose sometimes. So he says, you older ladies, don't get caught up in the idea of slandering. What is what is to mean to be slander, to slander somebody? Well, it's malicious gossip. It's lack, it lacks control of their tongue. It's exactly what James talks about in James chapter 3. Who can control their tongue? Who can? It's hard. But he says, don't, don't slander. Don't be backbiters or scandal, scandal mongers. It's so easy to talk about what so-and-so did in an unloving way, even as Christians. Within the church, there should never be any of this. Yet, in so many churches, there is gossip. And we, even when we don't say it and we hear it, we don't stop it. And he says, Older women should be the ones to put their foot down and say, no, we shouldn't be talking like this. It's not making false or unfounded accusations. Rather, than, rather they should be speaking the truth, according to what Paul teaches in Ephesians 4.15. And then there he, he writes these specific words. Instead, speak the truth in love. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Our words shouldn't be slandering somebody, but should be building somebody up. And if we hear someone saying something about it, we should stop it and we should go, no. how does that help them to become Christ-like? Live in a reverent way means our tongues are used to edify and build each other up. Solomon, the wise man of the world, said that the tongue has the ability to either speak life or death. Remember as a kid growing up, you hear this the old adage, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Tell that to a generation that is falling because of the words that are hitting them. Because as older generations, sometimes we look down on them and say, oh, why are they that way? We look down on them and we, instead of coming along and loving them where they're at and helping them to see Christ, we make, we, we belittle them. And we shouldn't be. A mother doesn't do that. And in the church, we're spiritual mothers supposed to come alongside them. We're supposed to have lived an example that is, that is not slanderous. 
that is not that of people who will trust us. They will come to us and they will seek wisdom and counsel from you. You should want that in your life because that's what God has called you to do. Remember, God said, go and make disciples in the church. This is it. If you're not living this way, then how can you teach the truths of God's word? Spiritual mothers are, are setting their example by holding their tongue. Not only that, it says they're not addicted to much wine. They're not drunk, lack of control of one's appetites and purposes, but they are level-headed. They are sober-minded. The, di the difference between, between what he's saying here is, is we don't want to lose control, the ability to think. Because what happens usually when people get drunk, things are said and done that are unnecessarily glorifying to God. And so he says older women live in a, in a reverent way by not slandering, by not being addicted, but to teach what is good. Strive to teach what is good. What is good? Well, Jesus said there's only one that is good. So our life, your life as older women should be teaching about Jesus, living Jesus, showing Jesus in a way that the younger ladies will look up to you and say, now there's someone I want to well, there's someone who knows Jesus and can help me to understand the conflicts and the struggles that I'm facing. To help me as I go through motherhood or spiritually, how do I raise my kids in a way that honors God? Or, or to, to someone who would just pray with me that I can go with and, and talk to about my struggles or who I know will not talk about it to other people. That's the thing that shouldn't happen in the church is we should be able to share our struggles with one another knowing that it won't be repeated because we should be uplifting one another. And here Paul says, likewise, teach the older women. So men, guess what? You're going to get it next month, okay? We're going to talk about it for your responsibility. But you older women, live this way so that, verse 4, then they can urge the younger women. See, if you're not living right, if you're living according to the truth about how are you to fulfill what God has called you to do, then if you're doing these things, then you can urge them. You're practicing the presence of God. Your opportunity is to urge the younger ladies to follow that too. Not to be judgmental, but to come alongside, to pick them up, to follow them. Which leads us to point number two. Spiritual mothers influence through encouragement. Encouragement. Do you know we all need to hear good words? And you know moms are the greatest at encouraging. Moms are the greatest. They know what to say, when to say it, how to say it. Dad, we just kind of mess it up sometimes. But moms are great at it. And here God says to take that which I put in you, that nature, the nurturing care, and use it in the church to help young moms, to help young ladies, whether they're your child or not, to encourage them to be obedient to Christ. You influence them through encouragement. You don't Tell them what to do and then send them off. You encourage them by coming alongside them, helping them, being there for them, being a voice that, that will pour into their hearts. Now what is it you're influencing them to do? It says right here, you're going to influence, urge them. That, that, the word urge, Paul uses very often about being important. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, I urge you to be of one mind. There's, there's this idea of, you know, uh, uh, that you, you, this is of the most importance. There's urgency here. You know, sometimes, what, what do we get, or what, do we, or what are we urgent about? What should we be urgent about in the church? The gospel. There's no better way to show or share the gospel than to be investing and influencing one another's lives. So it says, older ladies, you be a good example, and then you influence by coming along and urging these young women to do what? First of all, is to love their husbands and children. Hopefully they can see in you the love that you have for your husband and for your children. Because you've been faithful to God's word. Well, maybe you don't have any children. Guess what? In the church, you have a bunch of children. And I'm the biggest child around, and I need lots of mothers. I need lots of help, all right? You got to share a little bit. Oh, okay, all right. I'll, I'll share, I'll share, all right? But, the, but there's, there's some truth here to, to the idea that young women, they need to see 
good examples of what it means to love their husbands, to love your children. They need to see those things. And if they don't, say, if, if, it, if it's gone by, you know, you're doing it in the church. You're showing love to the, the, be faithful to those in the church by loving them and caring for them. You know, when I was, when I first came to Hollis and, and um, was meeting the youth, the, the leaders of the time, there were two leaders that stood out to me being the, the greatest, in my mind, the example, and he just passed away. They were older in the group. They were already in their 60s. Yet they were faithful to serve the teenagers as, as the best they could. And they were such great influences. They were like the grandparents of the group. And I could go to them for sound wisdom. And I mean, they were just great. I mean, uh, Jim was awesome. But Pat, boy, she helped me with the girls. I could go and ask her. And I could know I could get faithful wisdom from her. And that's what we need. We should be able to go to her and say, how would you handle this situation? Please pray for me in this. So here there's, there's a connection Paul is making between the older and the younger. And not just like the next generation down from you, but the generation after that. And the generation be always about being invested in influencing the young ladies in the church. Whoever comes in, go up and love them. Welcome them. Shower them with love to where they're like, wow, this is awesome. And so influence them so that they can learn how to love their husbands in their home. What does that mean? It's not just about emotional, if we talk about the husband first, not just about an emotional or romantic love that they have, you know, they're supposed to have that love, but more of the, the idea of sacrifice and service. To love your husband. Do you know this is the only time in Scripture tells the wife to love her husband? It's instructions to the old ladies, to the younger ladies, to teach them, urge them to love them, to serve them, to be sacrificial in the home, to be sacrificial in the church to one another. One of the best examples a young mother can give her children is thus love them is by her love for her husband. Because guess what? We train our children to go off into the world and what do we want them to know? How to love somebody else. The greatest example a father can give their children is how he loves their mother. The greatest example a mother can give is how they love their father. And in the church, how we expect them to grow if we're not loving one another. What a great testimony of the gospel in that day and age, because back in those days, there were arranged marriages. It wasn't like you got to pick and choose who you were going to date. Oh, I think I might go out with her or with him. It was, hey, uh, we've come to your daughter, and we've got your husband, and he's going to be this man over here, and you're going to marry him. And so in this idea of love your husband, it wasn't just about a quick connection. It was the idea to learn to love, to be faithful to the gospel, because, you know, you didn't get to know him. You got married, and that was it. And so when, when, when he's instructing these ladies, he's saying, teach them how to love them. Help them to learn how to love through the flow of the gospel. That they can be faithful as you are. It's the effort to love as Christ loved us and to learn to continually love no matter what. Not only to love her, to, to love her husband, but to love her kids. To love your kids, because sometimes kids can get belligerent. Kids could be um, hard to deal with sometimes. They make you want to pull your hair out. They make you want to run away and hide. Then they get bigger than you and you don't want to play with them anymore. Because they're going to hurt you. Found out the hard way wrestling with Josiah. When he lands on you and you hear pop, 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 you know, like it's no longer able to do this anymore. But as a mother, you know, to teach a mother to love her kids no matter what. To help them through those difficult times when they're trying to figure out how to navigate those waters. And think about the church when we gather here. How do we help one another navigate the paths of our children? To navigate the, the spiritual truths of each other that come in here. The spiritually mature should be helping the youngers to navigate and grow in their faith. So we influence by, by helping the younger ladies to love. To learn to love their husbands. To learn to sacrifice and serve them. To sacrifice and serve their kids no matter what. Are we doing that? Then he says, not only that, urge them to love their husband, but to be self-controlled and pure. What does it mean to be self-controlled? Well, that means to be sensible, common sense, and good judgment to have balance and wisdom. Which I have done. 
Common sense is hard for me sometimes. Oh, yeah, oh, I shouldn't have done that. We need each other. We need to be pouring that. I mean, to, to be self-controlled is, is the best way to learn it is through practice. The only way you're going to control something is practice. And having someone behind you to let you know you're doing it, you're doing okay. Even if you fall, even if you fall down, you're doing okay. Let the, let the spirit work in you to be sensible, to teach them how to have good judgment, to be discerning. Show them how to, to chase after the Holy Spirit and his instruction because he is the spirit of wisdom and knowledge and discernment. And so urge the younger women, urge the younger generation to be self-controlled, to be pure. All right, the word to be pure is to have a moral life that is above reproach and by reputation a one-man woman kind of woman. And it radiates from a heart that is totally surrendered to Jesus. This idea of being pure in our culture today, the definition of moral purity is, is kind of vague and gray. Even in the church. But does that mean we have to, you know, uh, go back to the Puritan days? Men on one side, women on the other side? Close the curtain? No, 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 that's not what, he, it's not, that's not what Paul is talking about. What he's saying is, is help them to see how to be self-controlled so that they can be pure. If we can control our appetites and our desires, our wants, and give them up for Christ, then we can understand what purity and holiness is all about. To urge them to do those things. And then he, he throws this in here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my best to explain it without getting in trouble. All right? It says to be busy at home. All right? So, most would define this as to be, uh, you know, moms are stay at home. That's where, you, that's where you belong. That's not what this says. I'm just going to put it another way. This is not saying a woman's place is in the kitchen. Even though it is better for her to be there than the man because the food is always better. <laughs> most of the time. Most of the time. All right? I'll never forget the first time I made pancakes using Rachel's homemade recipe, and it didn't come out right, and I said, Rachel? Why is my spoon stuck in the middle of it and I can't move it? <laughs> Literally, I could pick the bowl up and turn it upside down and nothing came out. I didn't make pancake mix, I made cement mix. She goes, what'd you do? I said, well, I packed the flour in the, pot, in the scoop. She goes, you're not supposed to pack it. I said, oh. Oh, you're not supposed to pack it in there? Oh, so I had like way too much flour. So I was like, okay, so I learned my lesson. I mean. I learned that she's a bad cook. I just know that. All right? But this, this word to be busy at home is not about the fact that you have a place. In. This isn't your only place. It's not negating the idea of you getting a, a job or pursuing those things. What it's saying that it's God is giving you responsibility to, to be a, a caretaker of your children, of your household. Proverbs 31, verses 10 to 31, it says that a, uh, that a, a woman uh, of godly nature is not just you know, sitting in the house, crocheting, or doing other things. She's busy. That's where busy at home is, is the, the, the mother plays like 20 different hats and gets paid for none of them. I think someone once figured it out if you paid a mother for all the jobs that she does. In one year, she would be making 667400 and something dollars. A year. Yet we do not give our mothers the honor that is due that. And even in the church, understanding all the things that have to take place in the home, we should be encouraging. Being busy at home isn't, isn't just saying you're stuck at home. It's the idea of urging them to not be lazy, but to be engaged in the discipleship of their children, the raising of their children, the support of the husband, to be loving their husband by doing other things, you know, uh, knowing what you need to go and get and taking care of it, you know, making the house uh, a beautiful home, not only for your kids, but so the neighbors can come in so that you can do what? Share the gospel. So you can live out the gospel in Christ. She is not lazy. She is not a busybody either. Being busy at home doesn't mean you're sitting there being busy about everybody else's business. Nor is she distracted by outside pursuits and responsibility that eat up her precious time and attention. What she's saying is older ladies urge the younger ladies, the younger generation that aren't married yet to see the importance of why they need to be home. Not that they can't work. 
But God has got, given them a responsibility to take care of and provide a good home. So that they can help others and serve others. And so Paul says, help them to see the need to be busy at home, not lazy, but to be focused on training and teaching and, and doing things that provide for their home. Making all these wonderful goodies that, you know, my wife is it's so funny when I hear she'll, she'll spend a whole day making like five or six things only to have it gone in 20 minutes. She has all that energy for 20 minutes of food. Thank you very much. Can you do it tomorrow? All right. Seriously, I mean, it, that's, that, it feels like, it, you're like well, it's, no, it's not a waste of time. You're investing in your kids. You're investing in the well-being of your house, and that's what it means to be busy at home. It's an investment in the future generations. And church, that's what we're called to be. We're supposed to be investing in one another, influencing that God may be glorified. Helping to see that being a diligent homemaker is not a bad thing. It's a God-glorifying thing. And being a homemaker doesn't mean you just go home, you stay home and you do nothing. You got a lot to do. And I see it and I come home and say, what can I do? How can I help? Without getting in the way, because I always seem to get in the way. I don't know. I'll walk one way and she's going the same way, so I get in the way. How do you help without being in the way? But seriously, I mean, the instructions here for, for us as a church to be healthy is that we're supposed to have these involvements, these engagements of, of helping one another. Then she said, teach them to be kind. That means to be like Jesus, to be gentle, considerate, gracious, and merciful. How to deal with anger. When you're kind, it's, it, it, we, kindness is kind of the opposite of being angry. How do we help each other, ladies? How do you help the others to, to learn to let go of their anger and be kind? To be gentle. To be considerate, gracious, and merciful. How do we do those things? Because you've learned how to do those things. And you can pass that along. Why? Because we want them to be like Jesus. And urge them lastly, so, to be subject to their husbands. Now this subject doesn't mean that the husband gets to lord it over them. This isn't about lord and, and serve. This is about... God's accountability about the fact that the husband is the one that is responsible before the Lord for everything that goes to that and he will give account for that it has nothing to do with the fact that women are less than men we are equal in God's eyes each responsible each one has their own responsibility they have to fulfill but here it's the idea of showing them it's not a bad thing to be subject to your husband it's the idea of taking a weight off of them saying he's responsible for that you do what God has put before you to do, and don't worry about that. God will call him to account one day for that. And so as, as women, in, in, in hard situations, we help them through those hard situations. Now, pastor, someone might ask, you know, how do we help someone to be subject to a husband that is an abuser? Well, you help them to get out of it. You help them to overcome that. That's what mothers do. Mothers are always the one you can go to to find answers. And for someone who, who always looked for a mother, because I didn't really have a mother growing up, I see the scripture and say, man, how awesome that would have been like to have someone like that in my life. Because it's not only the, the younger ladies that you're an example to, but some of these guys who come in who've, whose mother in our, in our day and age who maybe didn't have a mother, and you can become a mother to them and help them. Help the young ladies. Help them. That's the, the whole goal is discipleship. I'm very thankful for the mother that came into my life when I was 16. And uh, that over the last, I can't remember how 30 years almost, she's been faithful there and praying for me. For those last two years, it was nice to know what it's like to have someone who really wants to encourage you, to spur you on to follow Christ. And I'm very thankful for that. I'm thankful for my mother-in-law, who spoke to me several years ago and told me, man, you should be a pastor. And I said, no way, I'm just going to be a youth pastor forever. But she encouraged me. That's what mothers are supposed to do. Why? The very last part of this verse is so that no one will malign the word of God. 
You know, I've read this, and, and so often we focus on, hey, you, you know, you, you, you ladies, older ladies, you teach the younger ladies, it's your responsibility, but why do we do that? To make ourselves feel good? No. Spiritual mothers seek to uphold the word. The whole goal is to magnify and glorify Christ, so we want to live according to the word. The word of God is our very soul. It's our very being. It's a, it lights our path, so we help them to join us in that walk. It's being salt. It's being the light that God has called us to be. We're upholding the truths of God's word. Not man's truths, but God's word. Because we're reverent of his word. We're daily in his word because we see that we need Christ. We're encouraging the younger generations to follow Christ. The goal here is to uphold and live out it. Live out what? What God has planted in our, in our hearts. I mean, James talks about the planting the Word of God in your heart. And this is planting season, right? All you ladies out there get ready to plant your gardens. You plant it so it can do what? Die and disappear? You plant it so it can die and grow into a new, uh, new plant so you can get fruit from it, right? That's, that's the same thing. We plant God's Word in our heart. Not that it, we just put it there. So that it produces in us love and kindness and courage, the ability to encourage others. This is so that we also do not deny the very truths we proclaim to believe in. We say we believe in the Word of God, we better practice the Word of God. It is passing on to, to future generations the truths of being godly women upholding the Word of Truth. It's saying that my job on earth is not done until I go home. So therefore, I have a responsibility to pass on these truths. And, and the psalmist even writes these words in Psalm 71. He says, Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation. Your mighty acts to all who are to come. Do you know why he judges that the generations fell away from God and he did what was right in their own mind, in their own eyes? It's because the other generations forgot to pass on the truths of God. Do you want to know why we have we have people leaving the church? Because we're not passing on the truths of God. We're not investing in one another's lives. We're not, we're not coming alongside as a family and really lifting each other up. You see, this is the call of every woman. Every lady in the church has a responsibility to invest in the younger, the generation after them. To be a spiritual mother. This is our involvement with one another. This is our love for one another. This is our love for God demonstrated. And so on this Mother's Day, I am thankful for all the ladies in this church that gather here, that come. That seek to honor Christ. That seek to honor God. But my prayer is that you ladies see your responsibility. Whether you're 80. Whether you're 60. Whether you're 40. Whether you're 30. Whether you're 20. To pass on the legacy by being involved. By living as an example. So that you can influence by encouragement. And faithfully uphold the word of God. That it will not be maligned. The generation you live in will see Christ and know Christ. God's given us specific instructions, ladies, for you particularly. And we honor you for doing that. We honor you for the responsibilities that you take and do in your homes. Thankful for all that you do. But I want to encourage you this morning and, and ask you to pray. Where does God want me in this church? And how does he want me to serve others, the other ladies? To love them, to encourage them, to come alongside them. Maybe there's something you've got to work on yourself. That's what the gospel is all about, transforming us. That's the beauty of learning and growing together. And helping one another. I want us to be a healthy place where... Men and women come and they find strength and courage because they see Christ in our lives. And I pray, ladies, that God is beautiful through you. And that God uses you faithfully. We have a bunch of ladies, we have a bunch of people around us that need that. 
They need a spiritual mother. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this day in which we honor our mothers. And, and we look to the idea of maybe uh, some haven't had the opportunity to, to, to be a mother in that sense. But Lord, every lady has a, uh, an opportunity to be a spiritual mother in the church. To come alongside and to pray with and pray for and, and uplift and encourage. To pass on the truths and pass on the love that God has shown us. And to help them to come to know you as we know, as they know you. So Lord, I'm thankful for each of the ladies that are here and the ladies that aren't here. I'm thankful for their faithfulness to come and to serve. And I pray, Lord, that you would just be magnified and you would bless them and you would protect them and you would give them the strength that they need to be an influence for you. But I also pray, Lord, that in this church we will be a place where we see our responsibility to be an, a, an example, Lord, um, and an influence to one another. Because of our love for you, we seek to love one another, Lord. And I pray that there would be such a great connection in the, in, between the ladies of this church that they would shine forth and grow in the homes we bless because of it. So, Lord, I thank you for the great privilege that we have through Christ to be involved in one another's life. And may we do it faithfully and for your glory, which may we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to close by seeing him 599. So please stand with us. Jesus is Lord of all.
We thank you so much for our moms. We thank you for all that they mean to us and all that they've done. And we ask right now, Lord, that you would help us to honor them. But I also pray, Lord, that they would be uh, influential in your church. That you would use them mightily for your glory and for your great name's sake. So, Father, I pray right now your blessing upon each and every one of them. And we thank you now in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Happy Mother's Day.